Okay, so I asked you to write three to four sentences describing a global, national, or local environmental problem you've heard about and any efforts that are being undertaken to correct the problem. Let's see what you guys came up with. Hopefully we have at least one of each. I heard a lot of rumblings about different things. See what you guys put. So the Keystone Pipeline, that is, gosh, that's kind of global in a way because it's across three different countries, right? Um, but at the same time, national for sure. Uh, oil leaks, that's a global one. Gosh, my, there was a pipe break. Okay, that's a local. And then they fixed it. Through. Okay. BP cleanup. The Haitian earthquake created a global relief group that continues to rebuild. Okay, that's not really environmental, although it's terrible. More of a social studies thing. Oh, there we go. Fukushima. I don't know if it's spelled right, but we're going to go with whatever it says up there. Fukushima earthquake power plant, which had a meltdown two years ago. Yep, for sure. From that tsunami. Uh oh. Wait, my Bluetooth's not moving very well. Uh-oh. I'm going to have to be. That's really weird. So if you're talking, let's, let's stop. Okay, I can't compete with 30 of you. Maybe one or two, but not, not all of you. So we're looking at CO2 emissions now. It doesn't mean wait till I'm talking and start talking again either. Okay, so that's definitely global. The waste being taken in from Canada, that's, that's kind of that's kind of global, but more international between two neighboring countries. That's good. Oil in the Middle East. Air pollution in China, for sure. That could be global, right? It affects more than them. So you list a lot of things I talked about, global warming. Keystone Pipeline. Okay, the unemployment rate. Not that is a that is a local problem, but not an environmental one. Hurricane Katrina, a lot of pollution there. Invasive species. That's a local one. I like that. Zebra mussels. Okay. BP, the Gulf of Mexico, the oil spill there. That's kind of global. Yep. More. It's more national though, really though. Okay, so lots of good ones. So today we're going to be looking at conservation and restoration, the three ways people reduce the use of environmental sorry, resources, and how research and technology affect the environment. You guys just wrote keys about these. And we'll look at education and advocacy, the only real way to ensure that future generations do conserve and restore the environment, and why it's important for societies to consider environmental impacts when planning for the future. So this is kind of that end-all section for this whole ecology unit we've been on. And then uh, in a couple of days, we'll start the cell. Okay. So there's two major techniques for dealing with environmental problems. They are conservation and restoration. Conservation, we know, involves protecting existing natural habitats. That means you leave, what, you leave alone the things that are there. You don't mess with them anymore. Right? You, you conserve what is presently already there. But then there's this other thing called restoration, and this involves cleaning up and restoring damaged habitats. And that means you have to go into an area and reforest it or replace it with what used to be there, restore it. Which of those two things takes more work? A, conservation, or B, restoration? A, conservation, B, restoration. Which one takes more work? It is, it is B, I should have done C for kind of, I didn't. So yeah, definitely restoration B takes much more work. We know that. You, it, to, to fix something after it's screwed up is much easier. It's like, is it easier to do heart surgery or to not have a heart attack? It's kind of like a dumb question, right? Well, obviously, you know, not having a heart attack would be great. So the best way to deal with the environmental problem is to prevent them from happening in the first place. And conserving habitats prevents environmental issues that arise from ecosystem disruption, which leads to the whole Keystone Pipeline thing, right? Right now.
now there's not a pipeline there. If you put one there, guess what? In the future, when we not when we have like solar energy and stuff like that, we're then going to have to restore that. Okay, so why mess with it? Why don't we conserve what's currently there and not have to restore it later? That's the whole argument that is the other side of this pipeline issue. Same thing with like wetlands, right? If we left the wetland alone, we wouldn't have to dig up the Walmart, dig up the sand they put there, and then put more mud there later. It takes a lot more work making a wetland than just leaving one alone. So we can reduce our use of resources such as water and fossil fuels for energy. We can reuse goods rather than disposing of them. And we can recycle waste to help protect the environment. The three R's, right? Now, one of the best ways you can help solve the environmental problems is by reducing the amount of energy that you use and the amount of waste that you produce. Reduce, step one. So if I were to ask you the most important one of the three R's, you would tell me it is reduction. Don't use it in the first place, conserve it. Then you don't have to restore it through reuse or recycling. So the reuse of goods saves both money and resources. So if you do make something and it can be reused, obviously you should reuse it. What are some things that you guys reuse? Oh, my, my clicker doesn't want to work today. All right. What are some things that you reuse? Oh, I said a number. No, it's all screwed up. Hold on. Oh. What are some things that you reuse? Do you not say toilet paper? <laughs> I, I heard it. That's always that's always the The only kind of TP you want to reuse is ATP, right? Uh, uh, no. Now, I give my, my sister credit. She, has, she uses, she's like from Los Angeles. She uses like reusable diapers because she's all like into, I don't know how, I couldn't, you couldn't get me, you couldn't pay me to do that. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, it's nasty. But that's, that's, there's a service they use. They don't, they don't do it themselves. They pay that. There's a service that does this, yeah. So, let's see, dishes? Yeah, there you go. We, re we reuse dishes. That's kind of one that no one really thinks about, like dishes, silverware, right, glasses, water bottles, money. Yeah, that's a good one. Plastic. Imagine if they had to make new money every time. That'd be crazy. Plastic bags. Water bottles, silverware, backpacks, dishes, clothes, you know. Imagine like one use clothes. Lunch boxes, bed sheets. Imagine if every morning you woke up and threw your bed sheets away. Cardboard. Cardboard's more of recycle. Well, I guess you can use, reuse cardboard boxes. Bath water. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. There are bathhouses, yeah. You're not going to talk me into hopping into another person. Well, no, no. Expired medicine, toxic waste, cleaner. Who's reusing Kleenex? I guess handkerchiefs. That would work. Straw. Who's reusing straw? You ever wash out a plastic straw and reuse it? That's weird. All right. You guys came up with some unique ones. So the process of reusing things instead of taking more resources from the environment is called recycling. So the last one, the last resort. I know we think of recycling first, but really recycling should be the last thing you do. Taking what can no longer be reused and what was not reduced, and then creating something else out of it. So this is recycling existing products generally cost less than making new ones from raw material, like your paper. Nobody has to cut down a tree if we put our used paper in a basket and we send it to them, right? And then we don't need to cut down a new old, uh, you know, 100-year-old tree to make paper. Yeah. 
You know, I, I reduce paper because I give you Skyward assignments, right? So I give you a giant pack and kill a few. But it is a renewable resource, and we recycle. So what we cannot reduce, we re we reuse or recycle. So. Yes. Yep. Oh, that is funny. I'm gonna climb a tree. Climb, yeah. Stand on five pieces of paper. So that sounds like a Mr. Mason joke. So now we get into technology, all the stuff that's in front of us. Research and technology can help protect our environment by providing cleaner energy sources. It can provide better ways to deal with waste and improve methods for cleaning up pollution. Hello. Noah Thalen, yes I do. Your mama's here. Yeah. Oh wait, wait, not Thalen. Peeler, you mean? No, I don't. No, never mind, not you. They were looking for the wrong Noah. No, I, I, I was confused. I, I figured she meant you, but. All right, here we go. Researchers must determine the cause of an environmental problem before they can provide a solution to it. So before we uh, knew what was causing the global temperatures to rise, we knew they were rising, but then we had to make the connections try to figure out which of the greenhouse gases was increasing over the past, oh, you know, 100 to 1,000 years. So scientists make observations, they collect data, and after analyzing that data, a scientist may propose a solution to the environmental problem that was studied. So if increased CO2 is causing global temperatures to rise, all you have to do is what to CO2? Decrease. It's like a no-brainer. But the only problem with that is you have to change your whole source of energy on the planet. So proposals should take into account the costs, the risks, and the benefits of implementing the solution. So the costs are very expensive for reducing CO2 emissions, obviously. The risks are you might have an energy shortage, right? But the benefits are we don't become extinct. That's kind of, kind of weighs the other two a little bit. Unless you don't, you know, unless you're good with only 100 more years as a species, I guess we could. Earth's overrated, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to that fourth dimension, right? Was, yeah. Oh, the interstellar conversation. There we go. Yeah, there you go. I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. I have a seven-year-old and a ten-year-old daughter. I don't get to go to movies like that. I get, that's because she got a little baby. I know. it's it's. You, people... People laugh at me and don't have kids, but you really, you like stop seeing adult movies at movie theaters. Like, you don't see them anymore. So. Oh, yeah, I've seen Frozen. <laughs> well, let me tell you how many times I've seen Frozen. I've seen me some serious Frozen, let me tell you. <laughs> I can't wait. So <laughs> education makes people more aware of environmental issues. Education also shows people how they can help address such issues, what we're doing right now, right? Expressing support or advocating for efforts to protect environment. The environment can help get more people involved in these efforts. And so the whole idea of uh, the state requiring all of you to take biology and learn a little bit more about this and just address it is so that when you vote someday, you're conscious of the environment when you vote, okay? I always say my job is not to make a bunch of biologists because you know, only a small sect of you will go on to be like doctors or nurses, things like that. But we all are going to sit in a booth and vote on soil, air, and water quality. All of us. Well, it's not a booth anymore, but two little things. Someday I'm hoping we can vote on our smartphone, right? Why aren't we there yet? We are smarter than that, right? Can I tell you the real reason why? Is because old people are paranoid about technology. And the majority of voters are old people. I swear to God that's why. That's the only thing in my head that makes sense. So, and I love old people. I do. But in that one area, they need to not be so scared of that. Like, you know, my grandma won't buy anything off the Internet because you've got to put her information on there. 
successful. So many environmental problems. Yeah, like my grandma unplugs the coffee maker every day. I'm like, well, you just, just it. anyway. So we understand, right? You get it. So it's okay. Don't get there. I, well, mine do too, but they're, they don't. They probably know how to use like two things on it. Yeah. Okay. So we got to move. We got to keep moving. We'll get back to the, the the geriatric conversation. I promise. So many environmental problems have been solved because of the efforts of those who advocate for a solution, and conservation groups make efforts to educate people, protect land, and influence laws through what is called advocacy. That sounds like a test question. What is it when people make efforts to educate people to protect land and influence laws? That is advocacy, right? It could be, I'm just saying. So some organizations work on the international level. Others work on local environmental problems. Some groups help farmers, ranchers, and other landowners ensure the long-term conservation of their land. And individuals and media also play an important role in raising awareness of environmental issues. So if I asked you a question like this, oh, you silly thing. There we go. Oops. If I asked you a question and A was local, oops, B was national, C is global, if you were to try to make a difference, which one of these levels would make the most impact? Give me your answer. Which one of these would be the biggest impact on the world? On the world. A, local, B, national, or C, global? Let's see what you guys are putting. So your first instinct is to say, of course, globally, Mr. Mason. The only problem with that is we don't really affect the global, can I help you? I do. What do you need them for? Okay. Give them back as soon as you're done. So I know I, and, and you guys, it was kind of a trick question. It's not really nice of me, right? But you instantly want to think of global, but we can't really act globally. That's tough, right? But if everybody were to mow their lawn on a street, would you have a fully mown street lawn? I don't know how you say that. But would everybody's lawn on that street look good? Yeah. So it's that kind of idea. If I'm worried about what China's doing, and in the meantime, I'm not focused on the little things like recycling all of my paper, my plastic, and my glass, and I'm not focused on shutting off all my lights and making sure my water is conserved appropriately, if I'm not focused on me, and I'm focused on somebody else, then nothing ever gets solved. It's kind of like worrying about what somebody else is doing. Anybody, anybody's parents ever tell you not to worry about what they're doing, right? There's a lot to it, because while you're worried about somebody else not getting treated, or if you're not getting treated the same as somebody else, you're not really worried about you, and meanwhile, you aren't being taken care of. So I always tell my daughters this story. like, but he did it. I said, yeah, but he's going to be bagging groceries someday, and you're going to be a doctor. So I don't care what he does or she does. Okay? And, but honest, have honest conversations, right? So let's worry about what we do. If as a country and as a state and as a community we don't pollute, guess what? We have a cleaner world eventually. Boy, imagine how many wars we wouldn't have been in if we would have thought that way, right? Yeah, because it goes for everything. Can I go back? We worry so much about what everybody else is doing as, as Americans that we, we forget that we are just as imperfect in a lot of different ways, and we need to focus on ourselves first. Okay. We can always be better, right? We are the best, but we can be better. That's a bad attitude. That's how you... 
that's how you get to a point where you don't care about CO2 emissions and you think that you can use oil the rest of your life. And that's where we're at right now. Yeah. So educating the public about the environment helps gain public support for solving environmental issues, right? You have to have support of the community or guess what? Nothing gets solved. Environmental education can enrich people's experience of their world and empower them to care for it. I bet you the people in Virginia weren't aware that when they were going to start fracking there that they'd be able to light their water on fire. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, sure, we'll sign off on all those nice jobs you brought to us, but guess what? We won't be able to drink our water. Huh. Yeah, I don't eat water. There's farms in Texas that are shutting down because of this process as well. They can't feed their cattle or they can't give the water to their cattle because of the fracking. Oh, Lordy. Can I explain fracking at the end if there's time? I will. I will. So ecotourism, it's not bad if done correctly, but seldom it's done correctly. We'll say that. We'll, I'll tell you later. It's going to take a little bit. So then looking at ecotourism, it's not geothermal. No. This is one way to educate the public about the environment. Ecotourism is a form of tourism that supports conservation of the environment. We do this in Michigan. There's been a huge push for this. It's called Pure Michigan Campaign, right? You heard about this probably? So as part of our state parks, our national parks, we provide the people when they come in an education about how to conserve while they're there. Anybody ever been to, let's say, any state or national park and seen a ranger and had them tell you a few interesting facts and how they're trying to fix some things, prevent erosion? You see the signs as you walk through paths that say stay on the path, and they tell you why so you don't, prevent, you don't cause erosion. So this is all part of what is called ecotourism. Sometimes you're actually allowed to participate in the process of conserving and restoring. Here at the state park, they do prairie restoration where you can go out and collect seeds in the spring. Anybody ever done that? No? Okay. So often an ecotourist is given an opportunity to help solve environmental problems as part of his or her tour. In Hawaii, they, if, if it's in season, they let you help with the turtle eggs when they do the whole hatching of the turtle. That's kind of fun and, and keep, keep the beach safe. And you get to see turtles you know, laying eggs and ha or hatching depending on where they're at. So careful planning for the future can help us avoid damaging the environment and can help us solve the environmental issues that we face. If we want a safe, healthy, bright future, we need to actively aim for it, which means don't pay attention to what other countries are doing. Focus on, focus on your own future and keeping your own future clean. That way, if we all do that, we should be good. Now, we do have to set laws in place and things like that, but everybody should act locally. Society can uh, plan by noting the effects of certain activities, such as the development and resource use. How we are using our resources, are we reducing them, are we reusing them when possible, and are we recycling the ones that can't be reused or reduced? And after analyzing the risks, costs, and benefits of the community, the government may choose to enforce limitations on the development. That is why you're not allowed to <laughs> build upon wetlands. Everybody go, ooh. So, so when, government, when governments plan for the future, they can protect resources for the community for years to come. So here's the thing. If we put laws in place that do not allow businesses to build on top of wetlands, guess what? In 100 years from now, we still have what? Wetlands. It's that simple. And then we get clean water as a result. And so... If we conserve what we have and we don't destroy it, we will forever have clean water. If we do not, and we slowly allow one exception at a time, we will eventually not have clean water. So a summary, and then I will let you work. Conservation involves protecting existing natural habitats. Restoration involves cleaning up and restoring damaged habitats. We can reduce our use of natural resources, such as water and fossil fuels for energy. We can reuse goods rather than disposing of them. And we can recycle waste to help protect the environment. Now, research and technology can help protect our environment by providing cleaner energy sources, better ways to deal with waste, and improve methods for cleaning up pollution. All of those are extremely important.
And education makes people more aware of the environmental issues of, and of ways that they can help. Expressing support or advocating for efforts to protect the environment can help get more people involved. And that's the only way you're going to get uh, traction, so to speak. And careful planning for the future can help us avoid damaging the environment and solve environmental issues that we are currently facing. You need me to go back? Okay. Uh, 